Hackers attack systems that are not patched. You need protection, but virtual patching isn't working. That's why you go patchless. Topia analyzes, prioritizes, and remediates vulnerabilities before they're exploited. Even the zero days, all from one interface. Security gets better memory defense to complement endpoint strategy while improving overall vulnerability management and compliance. Adopt a hacker's mindset, eliminate vulnerability. Get your 30-day free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash vicarious. FlexTrack is the platform that helps cybersecurity practitioners get the daily work done. Red teams can create reports in half the time and track risk to resolution with the blue team. Teams can centralize remediation efforts across all scans, assessments, and audits. Effectively communicate risk in real time through simple visualizations, scanner and ticketing integrations, and robust analytics. FlexTrack is perfect for collaboration across all teams. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash FlexTrack to claim your free month. Are you an enterprise dissatisfied with overpriced analytics software that can't keep up with modern data? If so, then GraphWell is the solution for you. GraphWell is an unstructured data analytics platform for enterprises who demand total data visibility across their network. GraphWell lets your security team go beyond the SIM and fuse data sources to correlate and answer questions you didn't know needed to be asked. Go to graphwell.io forward slash security weekly for an unlimited data trial and gain uncompromising visibility today. Welcome back, everyone, to Balls Security Weekly. Learn how to conquer cloud complexity in our first Security Weekly webcast of 2021 on January 28th with Dr. Mike Lloyd, the CTO at Red Seal, myself and Adrian Sanabria. You can register at securityweekly.com forward slash webcast. If you missed any of our previously recorded webcasts, you can always visit securityweekly.com forward slash on demand joining us for this segment is none other than ming chow an associate teaching professor at tufts university ming joins us tonight to talk about a whole host of topics infosec careers all the way to devops ming welcome to the program hey paul how are you it's been a long time it has it has good to have you back on the show ming good to see and talk usually we see each other Throughout the year at conferences, uh, now we get to see each other virtually. It's it's not the same, but hopefully we get back to it at some point. No, it's not the same, but at least I got to see your face. So that, I mean, that counts for something. I mean, I, I mean, it, it's at least I can say, oh yeah, I got to at least see him in some medium. But it's always a pleasure. And happy New Year to you and your family. Um, all the best, best yes. of health, best of happiness. Happy New Year. It sounds like you, you wanted to uh, revisit some topics that we, we covered on uh, some previous shows. I love the topics that you chose. Um, I do want to start with InfoSec graduates. Are, now, are you, Ming, are you a full-time uh, professor? Full-time. Um, also, to put more context into that, much more context is on a given semester, I teach three classes. So I'm three and three uh, at the very bare minimum. Uh, last fall, I actually went three and a half because we started a co-op program at Tufts. Um, that's on the teaching side, but I also do a lot of the career, if not most, or lion's share of the career mentoring among our students as well. And when when students come out, and is it a, do you have a degree in information security, or is it just computer science, or what what is the the degree program you're teaching in? So. One of the biggest changes, so the answer to that is students come out with a degree in computer science. Mm -hmm. But what is that these days? I mean, that could be anything. So that degree, when undergrads come out with, you learn about programming languages, algorithm, theory of computation, um, Databases? Do you teach databases? I wish I paid more attention in database class, by the way. Database, yeah, there's the databases, there's the security, and of course, now there's ML and AI. Mm. I mean, they're two separate topics. So you learn a little bit about a lot in a computer science program. So I've been teaching in a computer science program for all these years. That hasn't changed. What has changed on our end is three years ago, due to a lot of 
comments from students saying, you know, I want to study more about X. And X could be cybersecurity, could be robotics, could be machine learning. And the students wanted, they, they, they weren't interested in some courses, some other courses, some other field, but they want to get more focus, more specialization, which as you know, I mean, that's, that's important is, you know, jack of all trades, getting a broad knowledge is very important, but the idea of some specialization is also important as well. So students now graduate with a degree in computer science. So you learn a, a, a whole breadth of things, but students can also now choose to do a concentration in cybersecurity at Tufts. So you get depth and specialization in the area. So that's been a big change since 2014. November 6th of 2014 was when I was last on. Do you, do you find a lot of students are opting for cybersecurity? And, and, and if so, why, why is that? Like, what, what's their motivation for opting in? Yeah. Um, I have, once we rolled out, when we rolled out the concentration program, in cybersecurity. I had a very good feeling it was going to be a hit. And surely enough, it, it was. Um, and I can't tell you how many times when we meet with industries, they ask, do you have a cybersecurity track? Fidelity Investments is a good example. They actually asked us during it. And of course, when that happened, I remembered, I darted my eyes over to Kathleen Fisher. It was like, now, here we go. We made the right move. Um, when students are comparing schools uh, between Tufts and Northeastern, they do ask now, do you have a cybersecurity program? Like, do you have a concentration on that? We are asked that. Like, that is absolutely a part of the consideration for... 18 year old when they want to do an undergraduate program is that because they want to be a hacker is that because they feel like it's a, a growing field or what what do you think their motivation is certainly the publicity helps hmm. i think everything that's been going on in the world has helped not hurt in that regard but certainly has helped they see dave kennedy on the news and they're like i want to be like dave I'm I'm curious from when you say cybersecurity degree, does what does this prepare them for? Is this a degree in security architecture? Is this a degree in uh, offensive cybersecurity and defensive cybersecurity? Kind of where does where does that um, degree or what does that degree provide them from a, a marketplace advantage? Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask a similar question, Ming. And that is it. How's the curriculum different? To what degree okay. is the degree? <laughs> so that is something I did want to touch upon a little bit down the road. I mean, that's, a, I want to, before I answer that, I want to, to say like, what's the motivation, like on why people want to do cybersecurity, you know, things that happen on the news. I mean, the media certainly has helped. Um, there has definitely been, uh, the word has gotten out. Um, of that, you know, cybersecurity is a career path now. It's not as much as we hope for, but it's definitely the, the word is out. Like, it, the word is out. People know that there are there is such a thing as cybersecurity jobs now. So that's important. That that's that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. It also helps when you know. Although it's not everywhere, but, you know, you take a look at programs like the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts now, is they emphasize, they do talk about, you know, cybersecurity. They do. I even did a program for Girls for Code five years ago on cybersecurity. So, you know, Five, seven, like 
six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old, like they've heard of it. I mean, if you take a look at, if you go to a place like DEF CON when we were in person, I mean, we had parents sending their kids, like you're bringing their kids to DEF CON now. It wasn't like the, you know, I would say the debauchery that we grew up like that we were familiar with. But now we've gotten to a point where we have parents bringing their kids and informing their kid that this is a career option. So that has helped. But now, because you asked about what does the degree prepare them for? Okay. I think having seen a lot of schools, seeing a lot of um, places like even community colleges that now offer cybersecurity degrees, which I think you, which you asked, what does it prepare them for? I see a lot of degree programs. I see a lot of programs going one or two directions. I see a lot of management and policy stuff. And I also see a route on pen testing. I've seen a lot of that. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, like, I, I, I hope that there's not the stigma that, like, you have to be a computer nerd already to do it. Uh, and I see a lot of degree programs and a lot of students, uh, more and more, that aren't the, yeah, like, I started coding at a really young age and I want to do computer science or computer security. I see folks that are like, yeah, I've always been interested in computers, but now I'm considering it as a career path. And they wouldn't necessarily consider themselves a nerd. They want to go through the program and, and see if they like it, much like you do in other programs. Like if you're interested in architecture, like does that mean you were studying like architecture and all that stuff? Like, no, you go to school to learn to see if you like it. If you do, you continue in that in that path. Do you see computer science and, and information security getting up you know, to that level where students can just come, hey, I don't have a lot of experience in coding, but I want to learn it, right? So you bring up something that I, I'm concerned with. One of the things that is a good thing, I think this is a good thing, is now the attention, and this is a, this wasn't available six years. I, I wouldn't say this six years ago. Now I can say there are education programs to learn cybersecurity. There are programs to learn cybersecurity prior to the collegiate level you um not only prior to the collegiate level but also at the collegiate level and also at the graduate level as well too mm. you see you, you see it across the board you see the education options available across the board and options are good having options is very very valuable you know, it's not like, oh, there's only one game in town, which is a which is a computer science degree. I mean, those days are long over. So now you have many, many options available. But the one thing that does bother me, and I think about this a lot, you and I, Paul, and everyone else on the show, we all are doing security and I'm sure we didn't even learn any of it while in, in, in the classroom. We didn't. A big reason why we're in security is because of intellectual curiosity. We like to tabble. We like to tinker. Like we like to break things apart. And you can't, and it's very hard if not impossible to learn that in the classroom. But now there, there are real formal education options. I hope that, that I, I really wonder now that there are formal career options, now there are formal education options, is where are people learning the intellectual curiosity stuff? I hope that doesn't go away. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm. Because a big part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is 
there is no black and white answer. That's totally not true when you talk about an educational experience, because in education, you know, you take a look at things like problem sets, homeworks, labs, they all have an end goal. They all have like a quote unquote answer, quote unquote, at the end. That's not how the world works. That's not how the real world works. Well, also, so, I, th- I think, you know, there's a stigma that you're going to come into ma- information security, right? And you've got to be a wizard. You've got to be the elite hacker. You've got to have, like, this certain technical chops. That's not always the case. And I, I kind of like the analogy that we've, we've drawn uh, more recently to the healthcare field where, yes, there are doctors, But there's a lot of other positions that don't require you go to school for 14 years, you know, to be the doctor. There's a lot of other other positions and other roles that require different skills and disciplines. I think information security is certainly that way. You mentioned policy and uh, in management. We need those skills as well. Social engineering is a different skill set. We definitely have the uh, breadth and depth within our field that we should not put that stigma of you have to be a nerd and you have to be a wizard in order to come in our field and be successful. It's gotten worse. I think it's gotten worse, Paul. Another big change that I have seen, and this is a significant one in the last six years since I was on the show, is cybersecurity now it's not just you, you mean it's not just a technical field i mean you take a amen. look at amen go <laughs> look at 2016 you take a look at the news now and you take a look at the media and cybersecurity is goes way beyond what we knew it involve a lot of political science and international i mean it goes that deep i mean you i mean yeah there are countries that are named all the time there are certain countries that are named all the time in in security it's just transcended into that level the technical skills now is just not even enough We do need to be more well-rounded and more welcoming of folks that want to be more well-rounded if we're to be successful in a lot of aspects of this field, for sure. Yep, and, and, and Paul, that's one of the things that we uh, we see all the time uh, at Guardians is that you just can't be a technical wizard. Uh, you, I think one of the big ones, you know, Tyler, you'll test to this, you need to be able to write. Mm. And you need to be able to communicate effectively, and that's, that's, that's huge because, yeah. you know, oh, I found all this stuff. But, but how do you communicate to that to, to give someone some actionable items? But it's even, it's gotten on that note, which you, you led, is, yeah, you have things like writing skills, communications. But at the same time, for someone who is trying to break into security now, um... I would say looking here, we're in the year 2021 compared to 2014 when I was last on, I think security has gotten a lot more difficult to get into. And for it's gotten a lot more overwhelming. Yeah, a long time ago, you know, you know, security wouldn't have, you wouldn't even have probably thought about things like, you know, misinformation and nation states. And for someone, and I, this is a big problem, a huge problem that I see all the time now is when students are thinking about cybersecurity, the biggest issue they ask is, I don't know where to start. And even I sometimes have a hard time answering that question for students is, you know, where do you start? I mean, there is, I mean, one of the beauties of cybersecurity is it's a very broad field. There's a lot of options. But at the same time, it's also a, a curse and that there are too many options. It's so overwhelming. Right. We tell people they need to learn a, a, a language. And is that Python or is that Russian? And yeah. well, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Right? 
Or is that and business? it's not just <laughs> Python. I mean, I get asked that question all the time, too, is I remember when I was doing a course preview and there was a student that asked what language we'll be using in the course. And my answer is, I know this is no bad questions, but I just say it's, you got to know almost all of them. But that's also a bad answer because it's almost like, oh, my God, it's like, you know, it's for, for someone, especially, God forbid, if you're 18 or 22 year old, you know, there's a reason why imposter syndrome run rampant, even for senior, because it's just now we've reached a point where this field is, it's just gotten so big and so broad and it's just too much to learn. And mm-hmm. there is no education program that can prepare you for that. Other than maybe so- 20 years of experience. <laughs> But there, there are other things that we can teach or encourage, and that is, I mean, you wonder about which language to learn. It's like, I, I, if somebody knew any language and knew how to, how to, how to code in it, I can teach them a new one. If they don't have no idea how to, how to do logic and whatever, that's, that's a bigger problem. Yeah, um, yeah. The, I like, like, or, I'd argue you don't need to be proficient in every language at a very high level. You probably need to be really proficient in one. But you got to know how to read and understand a lot more of them, right? I found that that's been a, a great skill set. Like, I, I am horrible at writing JavaScript. Like, I'm terrible at it. But I've made sure I learned enough to be able to read it and understand yep. it because that's important. And you right. got to know the fundamentals are absolutely critical. I mean, things like, I mean, even the basics like conditionals and, yeah. um, like, you'll know, just do even just that. Um it's just so critical. I mean, one of the outcomes of any good computer science program should be, you know, you can learn any language on the fly. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, Go or Rust or whatever the language, and there will be new ones in this mm-hmm. next 10 years. No question right. about it. Well, does that, um, does that it, lead to the, the bigger question of, is it more important to learn how to learn then, and you can go learn whatever you want, if you're passionate about something that is within inside the computer realm, then you can apply that. But you have to learn how to learn, which is really what most of us are. We're tenacious. We've always been continual learners, and we will always be learners. And so it seems like that's a really hard concept to teach, especially this new kind of sect of millennials that are coming out, that that instant gratification, the the instant knowledge, the instant you know $60,000 uh, a year job uh, right out of the gate, like that's expected. Uh, because of you know situations and environments, but how do we teach them uh, the qualities of learning, the the qualities of of hard work and doing your due time, and then tenacity? Like those are characteristics that are fundamentally very difficult to instill. I'm happy that this conversation, of course, is recorded. So I'm I'm happy that this conversation is recorded and we can share this live. You know, with anyone. You know, on a personal note, you know, I've been teaching. It's going to be, I'm going into my 11th year full time. And if you take a look at any of my teaching evaluation, anything, any of my evaluation, some of the stuff is out there. You know, the biggest complaint I get is, you know, I make people do the hard work. I don't tell you all the answers. You know, I make you, you know, learn how to learn. And there is a price to pay for that. Um, it's a very hard thing to do. And I get a lot of criticism for my teaching ability because of that, because I make people learn how to learn. Like if you're, if you're struggling with something, I like even like base, I'll give you a good example. Like if you're like questions on Git or like filters on Wireshark, you can look, you got to look that up. I can't tell you all the answers. I don't know everything. You don't know everything. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let, let, let's, let's go back yeah. to this. Uh, <laughs> even the most senior people, we all still have questions about Git and have to look it up every single time. <laughs> and Wireshark filters. <laughs> and Wireshark filters, for that matter. Except Git kind of takes the cake because, well, Linus. But anyway. I feel, and I'll say this on record, and I'll say this publicly, is there are many days I feel that teaching is a thankless job. Because, you know, a lot of it is because of that, is the students, 
especially if you're 18 or 22 year old, you don't understand that concept is, you know, your learning does not stop here. Mm -hmm. Are there people who think that college is end all be all of education? Yeah, absolutely. There are absolutely still even up to this day. And it is extremely hard. Um, a good example I can tell you of where things go horribly, like, you know, you can see this glaring problem is during like senior capstone um, in project based courses. And the students panic and they're trained in a way where what they, they, they ask the question, okay, what do I need to do in order to get this grade? Well, I don't think about the long term and the lifelong learning implications. The students think about, like what you said, the instant gratification and like, what do I need to do in order to get this grade? If you think about just that, what I just said, something has gone terribly wrong. I mean, like a lot of things, but that's certainly one of the things that, that it's certainly the wrong question to ask. And it doesn't set the student up, for, it doesn't set students up for success down the road when there are no, there is no such thing as grades in life. There so, is no such thing as <laughs> black and white answers in a lot of cases now. Hold on, Jeff. It's, yeah, I have a question, Tyler, and I raised my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Much love. Very pertinent to the conversation. <laughs> well, I. I I just keep. Uh, I, I have so many questions, Ming. It's great to see you again, virtually. Good to see you. Uh, I have my Wallace Sheep shirt on just for you. Um, I, I guess uh, you know I, I'm I'm of an older generation, but even most of the other hosts who are a generation as am I. behind me, as, am as, I. As, as as are you, you know, none of us grew up getting a cybersecurity degree. Um, exactly. Yes. Uh, I'm curious, A, short answer questions first. Uh, Tufts University, is it a liberal arts program per chance or not? Is that For still years, a thing? It is dubbed as a quote-unquote liberal arts school. Um, we do yeah. have this, uh, We have something called arts, science, and engineering. So we have a school of engineering and a school of yeah. arts and science, liberal arts. Yeah. So I'm curious, is the cybersecurity degree a, a BS or a BA? Okay. A? A? A or B? It's multiple it, choice. A or S? I'll give you an answer of a C. It's both. All of the above. Really? Okay. Well, All of the I'm, above. I'm, so students okay. have the option to do a BS or a BA. Yes, mm -hmm. we do get asked the question, like, which one do I pick? And, I, I, you know, it's mind-boggling that you can do a BA or a BS in computer science, but we offer both. But a strong majority take a BS because of the implication when it comes to mathematics. Like, look, the word on the street is the BA is a lot weaker. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I think in general that's probably a, a, a conception about a BS versus a BA or a BA versus a BS. But I'm, but I'm, uh, you know, given that none of the uh, big names, famous people. Everybody that we interview week in and week out on this show uh, ever grew up with a cybersecurity degree, BS or BA or otherwise, yeah. it, it begs the question, you know, why are people running to do that? Now, we've had many conversations on this show and other shows and myself in lots of venues, the whole question of, you know, what's more important, education or training or certification or experience. And... Uh, you know, I, I concede that not everybody can like get in at the ground floor like some of us of a certain age and and just sort of fall into it. Uh, it it's very hard to fall into this this business these days. But I'm I'm I, I'm still intrigued, and I don't have an answer for myself yet. And I usually don't like to ask questions that I don't at least have an opinion on. But I, I'm intrigued as to what's the utility of a. Uh, not just what is a cybersecurity degree and what, you know, how does it differ from your computer science degree, but what's the utility of it? And, and my ultimate question is, is it possible to come up with a cybersecurity curriculum that 
doesn't have computer classes in it that focuses completely on all this other stuff that we're talking about as as being equally if not more important in the grand scheme of things and would 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 probably almost naturally be a BA degree and and certainly a liberal arts degree but you know all I can say is I have a liberal arts degree I went to a liberal arts college and it's and I think what they taught me at that college and, and the way they expo- exposed me to you know different types of courses and all the different uh, you know fields of study, uh, if they taught me nothing, it was they taught me how to learn and they taught me how to uh, cut to the chase and you know what what's what's interesting and what's important about this topic or is it important at all and you can move on. Uh, I, I don't know. That, that's my some of my musings. No, and actually, I think about this all. I mean, Jeff, I think about your question on a day to day basis. I'm sorry. And <laughs> I want to actually let's start at the very top first. Is is forget? Yeah, I didn't get a degree in cybersecurity, and hell, I didn't even learn a thing about cybersecurity when I was an undergrad. At tough from 2002 to 1998 to 2002. So, okay. Here is the, let's start at the very top, which is, okay, so what's the value of a computer science degree? Now, here's the thing. Getting a computer science degree doesn't mean that you know how to program. And... One of the most glaring posts that I've ever seen, it was on, I think, Stack Exchange, that was, I just graduated with a degree in computer science, and but I still feel like I don't know how to program. Let that sink in. Mm-hmm. I thought computer science was like the hottest major in the world for years, and that we have a shortage of skilled not even engineer, but also program. It doesn't matter like which way you call them. We have a shortage of like skilled labor for this long. So what's the value of a computer science degree? Like start at the very top there. Um, I can tell you that in a lot of programs that I see, yeah, the computer science student get job, but it's also a tale of two cities. I mean, there are plenty of students that don't get job even with the computer science degree as well too. Computer science is also very broad, as I mentioned moments ago. So what's the value of a computer science degree these days? Yeah, you learn a little bit about a lot, but like, what does it give you? The knowledge to know that your code will never work the first time. (laughs) Definitely should set that as... But you didn't have to take a class to learn that part. True, very true. Or yet alone earn a degree. If anything, if anything, let's now talk about the cybersecurity degrees, okay? Mm. Let's talk about those. Like, let's get to that level now. So we start at the very top, which is what are computer science degrees? But what about cybersecurity degrees? Like, what do they give you? I think, Jeff, that's what you're asking. Like, what do they give you? How do they differ than you know, things in the past. Yes. Is that, that, is that what you've been, what you're trying to get at? I'm yes. not trying to get at anything. I'm just, you know, I have all these questions in my head and they just, they, they come out every once in a while, usually on this show. No, and then we think about <laughs> these all the time. If anything, if anything, if anything, you know, if you're going to a cybersecurity program, the premise is you're going to learn things specifically to cybersecurity. Risk analysis, pen testing, malware, analysis, networking, mm-hmm. network security. Um, what other topics would you would you do? Um, reverse engineering. Perfect. Um application security crypto apps crypto crypto perfect <laughs> you do a degree you do a degree in cybersecurity 
And those are your options. But you also don't need to do things in things like, you know, if you're if you're not a theory person, chances are you don't you probably don't need to take things like linear algebra. Or oh, algebra man. or theory of computation. Next thing you're going to say, we don't have to take Boolean algebra. So what does it accomplish? Off the top of my head, what it can accomplish is, okay, you can, you, you, you walk out with a piece of paper saying, okay, now I have learned so many different things that have to do with security. That's one. Mm-hmm. Number two, you know, it's it's specific. It's specific. It's, it's definitely specific enough and not as broad as, oh, let's say a computer science degree. Number three, yeah, we're all right now here on Security Weekly we have a good grasp on what's really needed to succeed in a cybersecurity job. But the problem is, is when you deal with things like human resource and HR, and they look for X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, A, B, C. I mean, how many cybersecurity jobs do you see out there that require some sort of a computer science degree, which may have nothing to do with the job at all? Yeah, kind of, kind of interesting. I, you know, I've debated this with with people and with myself about one thing that, uh, for example, that a degree in cybersecurity gets you is the degree. And for some jobs, you need that. <laughs> when I applied for a job at a university, they're like, "You need a degree." I'm like, "Any degree?" They're like, "Yeah, you just, you need a degree to to work here, like at this specific job level." I'm sure the government probably has similar, and other organizations have similar things. Like to be at this pay grade or above. Yep. You need to have a degree. Doesn't matter what it's in, but you need to have a degree. I'm sure this still exists today, correct? So does no, that it does still that... exist today? And who knows if it's ever going to go away? Mm. I mean, what is that called? I mean, that's called what credential signaling, right? If anything, you know, a cybersecurity degree does the credential signaling. <laughs> Only a security. college professor would actually have a name for that term for that instance. Just saying. <laughs> So is is that a is that a uh, a problem with our inability to set expectations for students from a higher education standpoint? If we set the expectation as you by getting a degree, yes, that will most likely get you an interview for a job. Setting that expectation of you're going to come out and be a rock star in the cybersecurity world, or you're going to be able to go get a job anywhere in the world and do whatever you want. Like I think that that setting of the expectation falls back to not only the people that are doing the hiring and the people in the industry, but it falls yep. on the higher education institutes to make sure that they're communicating that appropriately. Wow, and then it gets even worse. And that actually leads to up to something that you brought. And then the higher education folks, they never almost talk to, they never talk to the industry stuff. So there's a huge disconnect there. <laughs> the other yes. So, yeah, I mean, you have a communication problem between the industry and uh, the employees or whoever you're trying to hire. You have a communication barrier between, you know, the education and then the students. But then you also have an education, you have a communication issue between education and industries as well. Well, I was going to say, I mean, this is not unique to cybersecurity. I mean, that's that's the difference between the academic world and the real world, just in general, in my experience. Yeah. Um, and one other thing I, I also before, and this is important because we mentioned this word many times so far, is, you know, if anything, you know, the degree is not only for credential signaling, but also for instant gratification as well. That plays a role in the creation of all these different degrees. Whether it is undergraduate or graduate, it doesn't matter. Because we, you know, let's, let's, let's admit it, we do live in an age of instant gratification now. 
I mean, it is what it is. And so it feels like, oh, yeah, cybersecurity degree. Yeah, it's like a fast track to get into cybersecurity. I still think there's a foundation that uh, folks need to add coming into information security. And it, it may cross really any kind of level or different types of positions that we have in InfoSec. And that is you need a fundamental understanding of IT concepts uh, and, and things of that nature, right? You gotta understand how, if you don't understand how to build things, you have to understand how things are built, maintained, uh, set up, how, you know, communications work. I think one of the things that, you know, newer folks kind of struggle with is aside from the technology, which I think is important to have some level of foundation in, in yep. technology, but also just the the inner workings of how uh, a business works, right? It, it, from small to medium or large size businesses, you know, how, how things are, 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 are set up, right? You, you need some fundamental level of skills that are not necessarily specific to information security, but are required as a foundation to be able to work really in many of the jobs in the, in the future. There is a reason, yeah. And that is a big reason why I tell students this. I almost sound like a broken record for saying this. Is, look, the classroom experience is not enough. If all you do is just the labs and all the homework, like you've been trained, like in the exams, like you've been trained for all your life to do, I'm sorry, that maybe only get you like 5% of the way, 10% of the way through things. Um, what am I trying to say is this. The classroom experience, just doing the bare minimum classwork, classroom work is not enough. Just doing the bare minimum classroom work is not enough. Just doing the bare minimum classroom work is not enough. There is a reason why I put such a high emphasis on jobs and why I put a high, and people know me for this, is people know me for putting an extremely high emphasis on things like jobs and careers, extremely high. And why is that? Because you really, really get a real solid education. You have to have a mix of both in the classroom. And most importantly, if not even more important, by far and away, outside the classroom experience, projects, internships, things like learn about, so in that case, you actually get hands-on experience learning about things like the business, learning about how to talk to people, and hell, even learning things that you won't even have a chance to learn in the classroom. A good example is, um, I, I don't know of a lot of, um, I know we don't at Tufts, we don't use, we don't teach Docker. We don't teach containers. We don't actually teach using cloud. And if you go to any industry these days, you know, in tech, they're going to use either or and, you know, cloud and containerization. You're not going to learn that in the classroom. You learn that on the job. And somehow that message is still not registered with students. Is the classroom experience is not enough. So could that be solved with things like more rigorous and in-depth internships and partnerships with larger companies or even smaller yeah. companies for that matter. Uh, we right. took on two internships with a very small company here. And part of that was to facilitate, you know, some of this next generation community giving back like those, those mentorships that we used to get by getting chewed out by one of the old curmudgeonies on a, a BBS forum. Right. And them taking us under the wing privately, like, that has to be, I think, instilled through internships now because higher education is still important. People still have to slot that time to do things, but that on the job is the only place that they get real world exposure, see how business works, see how consulting works, seeing how cybersecurity as a whole uh, is playing into their life and then what they're actually interested yeah. in. They may not even be interested in any of this. And so that internship, I think, needs to be more rigorous. How can we facilitate that better? 
I just want to agree with, before you answer me, agree with Tyler. I think you're, you're on to something there because I would rather have students learn some of that on the job and focus in the classroom on, in order to build containers, like you should probably understand how Linux works first and have done that before you move to containers to configure cloud services. You should probably understand how the basic protocols on the internet, SMTP, DNS, and databases work before you go configure RDS. So teach that in school, use internships, fellowships, and those mentorship programs to, to start learning about containers and cloud. Would be my, I don't know, Ming, thoughts? I want to say three things. And the three things that are absolutely true that I see up to these just today. One, look, we're in a pandemic. And now I think the cry of the questioning of the value of, you know, four-year college education has gotten higher. No question mm -hmm. about it. No question about it. I think that hasn't changed. There's a lot of people now questioning what the value is. So schools need to deliver, okay, you really got to show your value proposition now. Uh, number two, if the other thing that has changed, six years ago when I was on the show, the whole idea of mentorship really didn't take off, really wasn't there yet. Here we are in 2021. I'm working with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on a cybersecurity mentorship program. We launched the inaugural mentorship program in fall 2020, and it was a smashing success. We paired students at many different institutions in the state. four-year colleges, and also, most importantly, community colleges with real industry mentors. That happened, yes, fall 2020, yes, during a pandemic. And it was a smashing success. This is a mass cyber center. We ran, we, we helped run this program. I would not have imagined something like this six years, the last time I was on the show. And I can also now happily say that we're doing round two for spring 2021. Um, I think the application can open up next week. Um, pairing students with real industry mentors and you do a real project. Students and mentors do a work on a real learning project. And I can't tell you how far that can take a student these days. So you really get to not only get real experience, but you also get to see how like a certain organization work like a bank. Um, that's extremely uh, something I'm really happy for is uh, mentorship programs. Like they like this is a formal mentorship program that is run um, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and about more rigorous internships. Well, yeah, I mean, now, I mean, they're still going on, but I still tell students these days, and I'll repeat it again, is, you know, an internship opportunity is more, if not even more important than a piece of paper that you get when you graduate out of four years. Well, I think the opportunity part of that is the, the most important thing, right? Uh, well, and, and I think there's, there's two sides to that. I think the students have to view that as an extremely valuable opportunity. I think we as the older curmudgeon folks need to set aside the time to mentor those folks and take on the, the interns and spend time with them. Because you know what? At some point in our careers, someone spent some time with us while they were busy with their day jobs and we were asking what would seem like stupid questions, which, which is bad. I mean, the only stupid question is the one you don't ask, right? We were getting answers to our questions, someone was taking time out for us, we need to do the same thing for yeah. uh, the next generation coming in. I no. was thinking in the, in the other direction where, you know, some days we're going to need somebody to wipe our ass for us. You, that, that I, I think there's a difference in our ages. You might be closer to that than I am, Jeff. Well, so last year I turned 40. Oh my God, you're a baby. Yeah. And 
band fun. You know, one of the things I say to myself is I, one of the things, you know, everyone makes mistakes in life, but one of the mistakes I didn't make was choosing cybersecurity as a profession. No mistake about it. I do not regret that because you learn something new every day. I also do not regret any time that I spent on mentor pro- mentorship program. No regrets, absolutely none at all. And I say, look, we're not getting any younger. Yeah, I mean, Lee and, Jeff, Lee and Jeff turned 40 like Kennedy was still president, but, you know. And well, <laughs> hey, at least he Cleveland was, wasn't president. here's another thing. How many of us are actually thinking about... Jeff's doing math. How many of us are thinking about, <laughs> you know... What we might not do this for much longer. <laughs> we might like- not do the security thing for much longer. We may want to do something else. Like that's something I know that that has crossed a lot of people's minds because of how demanding and how much you need to know and how much you need to do in security. You know, it's going to reach a point that you're going to say, "I can't do it anymore." Um, it's just so overwhelming. There's so much to do. And the mentorship program becomes important because look at and, and it helps to know that if you train someone well, you know that there's going to be the field is going to be in good hands. You, you, you that's that's one. But the other thing is, you also and I also keep this in the back of my head because if, if, I, I hate to bring up everything that transpired yesterday, but let's be honest here: the education system in this country needs some serious ass improvement. And like, see, education needs some serious ass improvement. On, on, mm-hmm. I, I'd argue on multiple fronts, right? <laughs> both with the the curriculum, both with the accessibility. Uh, it, there, there is a lot of room for change and improvement there. Agreed. Yeah, especially in engineering. I, I think, especially in the engineering fields. And engineering, yeah, I mean, I'll give you a, the, the thing I tell people is, you know, in engineering, the way it's been taught is, oh, it's, oh, it's only a black and white answer. You know, you get it wrong, you get a red marks on your way, but that's not how engineering works. Like, where's the room to fail? Like that. I mean, I'll, as I said, right there is, like, at the very basic level, why engineering education needs to change big time. Um, but the bottom line is this, is that, the education just is, I, I almost want to go so far to say it's just piss poor. I mean, you take a look at the just case in point is the misinformation problem. Like, why do we have such a big misinformation problem it's like it's up to this day? Social media. Uh, yeah. Wait, Cyber that, security majors. Was that a rhetorical question or? <laughs> yeah. Logic, logic and common sense. Is this sense. multiple choice? <laughs> And so that's why I do not regret any time that we spend on mentoring because we know that education needs some serious ass help, serious, serious help. And there are still plenty of schools out there who would love to offer something in cybersecurity, but they just can't, whether it's because of, you know, lack of knowledge or or budgetary problems. And so I feel that that's one thing I do that, you know, the mentorship and the education is something I do not regret at all because it's in dire, dire shape right now. Uh, Ming, uh, other than the last thought, any closing thoughts? Uh, I know we didn't get a chance to talk about the other topics, which means we have to have you back, but I appreciated the discussion uh, and enjoyed it very much on this topic. I mean, yeah, I, it's always a pleasure, of course. You know, I wish today, I wish that Russell Butterini was also on because we could have done the Stadler and Waldorf show. But um, Yeah, what, happen- yeah what happened to, to, to Russ? He, he had a family, he had a family oh, emergency. Okay. So, Hope all is well uh, of Russ. Yeah. I haven't seen him in a while either, so. Yeah, well, I have to have you both back there. So as per usual, we covered like one of the ten topics we were going to cover tonight? Yep, yep. We want to, I mean, the next time I want to be with, uh, be on with Russell. We want you it. back. We yeah, we'll, you back. we'll bring you back with Russ and we'll, we'll pick one of the other topics. How about yeah, we, I got to do, I got to, I mean, I, I mean, I've known Russell for a long time now, like since 2013. And, you know, we always joke about, we got to do the Stadler and Waldorf show. And so far, it surprisingly has not happened. 
Well, we'll bring you back to do just that and more. Ming, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. Paul, oh, pleasure. Always. And to the rest of the team, an absolute pleasure. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back with the security news for this week. Stay tuned.